Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of SNC's Critical Insights Series. I'm Stuart Robertson, co head of SNC's Global Product Development and Finance Group in London. Today, we're going to talk about the rapidly emerging expropriation and asset seizure risks to foreign companies operating in Russia and more broadly around the world. In response to the horrific events that are taking place in the Ukraine, many multinational companies have announced in the last few weeks plans to sell, suspend, or otherwise scale back their operations in Russia. And Russia's president has suggested in public statements that the Russian government could take steps in Russia to seize assets of those companies or put them under temporary external management of the government. This is not the first time Russia or other countries for that matter have threatened or actually carried out such seizures. Whether these actions come to pass is anyone's guess, but there are practical steps companies can take and consider in preparing for the worst. To discuss these steps, I'm joined by my New York-based colleague, Andrew Finn, coordinator of SNC's arbitration group. We both have had lengthy experience in dealing with different aspects of investor state disputes in various regions around the world, including the former Soviet Union. Let's start with some practical steps that can be taken from a business operational perspective. In the past, we have seen that governments can act very quickly to seize local operations or assets of foreign companies, giving very little warning. There may be, in fact, little or no chance to lobby or negotiate with government officials or to get any meaningful local relief to prevent the government from taking action. So how can you prepare? First and foremost, ensuring the physical safety of staff and advisors and their families is obviously critical. Have a plan in place, whether it's for purposes of evacuation from the country and or an orderly shutdown of operations to ensure local staff know what to do if government officials show up without warning to take over. Second, and relatedly, consider ways to protect tangible and intangible assets in the country from being taken and misused without your authorization. The nature of those assets, of course, will vary from company to company and the nature of the business and its operations. But an example is when a company relies on key software to operate. Do you have the capability outside of the country to control or disable that software to prevent misuse? Some companies have the ability to maintain key software in jurisdictions with reliable and enforceable IP laws and offered as a service to their affiliates around the world via secured access. Third, maintain corporate records outside of the at-risk country. Once the government takes control, you're unlikely to have access to local records. The emergence of cloud-based systems to store corporate data remotely without relying on physical servers located in a vulnerable jurisdiction has helped many companies maintain control of their data. This can be complicated in some jurisdictions by data privacy and protection laws, so make sure to consider those when devising your corporate cloud procedures. Fourth, understand your corporate structures thoroughly, including relevant corporate authorities. We have seen Russia and other jurisdictions impose management of local entities and suspend rights of the foreign owners of those companies for acting for the local entity. It can be very valuable to work through in advance what you can and cannot do if faced with that difficult scenario. Fifth, understand the knock-on effects on your broader business including whether a debt covenants or other contractual obligation is impacted if you effectively lose control of the exposed operation or assets. Sixth, consider your public relations strategy so you can respond quickly to the government narrative. Seventh, to the extent consistent with your business objectives and local law, consider moving liquid assets offshore through appropriate intercompany arrangements. Finally, consider other stakeholders who may be able to assist including governments who may have access to diplomatic channels and potentially large existing creditors of the relevant country who may have additional practical ability and leverage to advocate on your behalf. Let's now turn to legal claims. Andrew, what are some considerations on that front? Thanks, Stuart. Another important aspect to consider is what legal recourse your company may have to seek relief or recover damages if a foreign government seizes property in their country without providing just compensation. The legal paths will vary depending on the particular circumstances and jurisdictions, but generally they fall into four categories. The first is potential contractual remedies. Some companies have direct investment contracts in a host country and with a host country's government, governing their investments in that country and their business in that country. Those contracts often provide for some recourse, typically through an arbitration proceeding in a neutral third country. 
those contracts need to be dusted off and carefully scrutinized to determine what remedies may be available and the steps to pursue those remedies. The second potential path is through treaties. Many countries have entered into treaties that provide protections to foreign investors. For example, Russia has bilateral investment treaties with more than 60 nations, including Canada, the UK, as well as several EU countries. These treaties often contain promises that the host country will not expropriate or nationalize assets without just and prompt compensation and will treat foreign investors fairly and equitably and no differently from domestic investors. Again, the enforcement mechanisms for these treaties are generally through arbitration. If you have a path to arbitration, it's also important to consider how long it will take to get that process moving. Treaties, for example, oftentimes have months long cooling off periods after you provide an initial notice of dispute before you can actually start the litigation and get an arbitral tribunal in place to decide anything. These periods are meant to allow for a pre-arbitration negotiation to resolve the dispute. It's also important to analyze the likelihood of recovery from any arbitration process, which unfortunately often takes years to complete. Many countries, including Russia, have aggressively fought against investors seeking compensation through arbitration in the past and have tried to insulate their state from having assets outside of their countries that are available to pay any arbitral award. So companies need to consider not only the merits of their claim, in other words, whether they may win or lose, but also how they may actually recover on any award and how an enforcement process of an award may play out. The third potential path is through courts. And this can take several forms. If you are ultimately going to pursue arbitration, for example, through a contract or through a treaty, there may still be courts who have jurisdiction to assist in supporting an arbitrator or to adjudicate related issues that may be useful. For example, depending on the circumstances and the place of the arbitration, as well as the relevant rules, there may be an opportunity to seek an injunction or other interim relief from a court in aid of the arbitration. But as I said, the ability to do so varies widely in different jurisdictions. Companies may also want to consider other local law remedies in the relevant jurisdictions. Depending on the jurisdiction, this may not be a feasible path, as oftentimes governments will simply pass laws allowing them to seize property under their own state laws. And sometimes local courts are unreliable in any event. If you do pursue local law remedies, care should also be taken, as some investment treaties have specific provisions governing when and how you can seek relief in local courts without waiving a treaty claim in an arbitration. And following on Stewart's points on contingency planning, it's important to think through whether there may be a need to quickly pursue a corporate restructuring to protect your company and its business in the case of a major asset seizure in a particular location. Determining where you could pursue a formal restructuring of your business may also be useful. The fourth potential path is insurance. Companies should consider what insurance policies they have in place and could put in place. The classic example is political risk insurance, which may cover for events of expropriation or nationalization of assets. And if you do have potential coverage for an event, be sure to understand the claims process and when a claim needs to be made. Finally, some practical points in terms of supporting any claim that may have to be brought in the aftermath of government action. You are going to want access to corporate records and employees who know local operations in order to help build any case you may need to bring. As Stuart mentioned, with cloud-based and other remote data storage options, it has become somewhat easier to maintain corporate records no matter what happens in any one location. But this is still an important issue that needs to be focused on. In addition, it's important to secure local legal advisors. Any arbitration that is brought is likely to give rise to disputes about local laws 
and whether and to what extent they apply in the face of an investment contract or investment treaty, which often applies public international law. We have seen in some countries, governments take steps to intimidate local legal advisors or otherwise prevent local legal advisors from advising foreign investors. Therefore, it may be prudent to consider whether backup legal advisors outside of a particular country may have knowledge of local law and could be useful in the case of an expropriation event. Of course, that's not always possible, but it's something that may need to be considered. Thanks, Andrew. It's never pleasant to be faced with an asset seizure or expropriation of a business, but companies in many places around the world are facing growing political risk that could lead to just that. Taking steps now to prepare for the worst can pay off later. Mm -hmm.